Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta rebuffs the rerun election demands of opposition leader Raila Odinga. Thousands of undocumented immigrants are in limbo following the U.S. Attorney General's announcement to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. And aid groups criticize efforts by European leaders to stem the flow of migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, arguing Europe's economy needs more workers. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Kenyan opposition leader Raila Odinga's coalition is threatening to pull out of the presidential election uh, rerun now set for October the 17th unless it is given legal and constitutional guarantees. Kenya's Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission Chairman uh, Wafula Chebukati said Tuesday he has appointed dif uh, different officials to be in charge of the October 17th election. Now, the appointments were announced hours after opposition leader Raila Odinga said his coalition would not participate in the rerun unless some officials were removed and its voting technology audited. As far as we are concerned, it is not just you know, the day, the day. It is the preparation for these elections, uh, which is more, more important to us, that uh, there must be proper preparations we must deal with uh, all the irregularities which were committed, beginning with the people who committed them and also rectifying those irregularities. Well, Odinga also wants criminal investigations to be opened against the Electoral Commission. He also wants the election held on October 24th or 31st instead of October the 17th. President Kenyatta, who has not been accused of any wrongdoing, has dismissed Odinga's demands and says he is ready for the repeat election. What we're saying is, the court said that according to the laws, the election should be repeated in 60 days. Is that true? Yesterday, the IEBC told us that the elections are going to be on the 17th. I want to say it here, that the way we're ready on the 8th of August, we're ready for the 17th. Well, Odinga has contested and lost the last three presidential elections in Kenya. Each time he has said the vote was rigged against him. Now, suspected militants from the Somali group Al-Shabaab beheaded four men in two different attacks in Lamu County on Kenya's north coast on Wednesday. That's according to local authorities. Now, the county commissioner said the attacks took place in Selini Mashambani early on Wednesday where three people were killed. The third person was killed in a separate incident in Bobo Village. The official said about 30 heavily armed assailants went to house, uh, from house to house, calling out victims by name before pulling some out and slitting their throats. The attackers surrounded all the victims' houses, making it difficult for them to escape. Now, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions on Tuesday announced the end of DACA, the immigration program, whose full title is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, former President Barack Obama set DACA in motion to provide work opportunities and protection from deportation to roughly 800,000 immigrants who came to the U.S. as children without proper documentation. VOS Ramon Taylor has more. I'm not sure how I will go home later today and explain to my mom that the help I have been providing her is not there any longer. 20-year-old Flor Reyes helped her single mother raise her five younger siblings, all born here so they are U.S. citizens, but suddenly she finds her future is uncertain. We are, have come out of the shadows only to become even in more danger. Her reason is one that affects nearly 800,000 others. Like Reyes, all were born in another country, but grew up in the United States. In many cases, they know no other place as home. Until Tuesday, when the government announced the closure of the program known as DACA, they could count on renewable work permits and protection from deportation. There is something in the air that you can, I can or at least I can physically, almost physically taste that's such this heightened tension. Tension turned mass civil disobedience in front of New York's Trump Tower, a response to the administration's decision to end DACA for legal or possibly legalistic reasons. The Constitution assigns the role of lawmaker to Congress, 
The executive is tasked with enforcing that law. President Trump could not give these uh, these folks a permanent solution. No president can. It's beyond any president's uh, constitutional authority. Obama knew that. President Trump knew that. So Congress has to fix this. It's a point that doesn't sit well with activists and leading proponents of the program, from the White House to Trump's hometown, who argue the decision is an act of hypocrisy. The legal analysis about DACA's legality has not changed at all. It is the exact same legal analysis that existed at the very start of the Trump administration. When, the Trump, when President Trump himself said that the Dreamers could rest easy, nothing has changed in terms of the legal analysis. The only thing that has changed is the politics. And with the program scheduled to end completely in March, unless a divided Congress enacts legislation before then, nothing feels certain. I don't have any hope in this government or even in this country, if I'm going to be honest. My hope is really with these people that you see here with, with us today. This is where the movement's going to really get its power, and this is the people of really who are going to lead the next generation of, of warriors. We are the voice within your heart, times 11 million, so listen, so listen, come on out. Ramon Taylor, VOA News, New York. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, one of China's biggest textile mills is making plans for its first North American factory. Stay with us. This is Bizbeat. Getting away from the heat is what draws tourists to the new Al Balid Resort in Oman's southern city of Salela, a luxury retreat designed to pamper guests who come during the summer monsoon. General Manager James Hewitson says almost all of the guests are Arab during the misty, cloudy, and rainy season. So we will have 26, 28 degrees um, with gray, gray skies and, and mist and rain, whereas the rest of the Middle East is in 50 degree heat. Away from the resort, guests enjoy many excursions while also going on long, muddy hikes, but are rewarded with luxury treatments, infinity swimming pools, and spas. Guest Muna Al Ajmi. In a country where mostly the weather is hot, this itself makes it magical. This luxury destination is in a region spurred by an Omani initiative that includes a new airport and road networks. Cool down escapes start at $370 a night. For BOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexio. On Wednesday's financial reports, Nigeria and South Africa are reporting strong economic growth for the second quarter of 2017. Joining us now from New York with more details is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Mal Andrino. Hello, Jill. Hi, good afternoon. So South Africa has climbed out of recession bolstered by strong performance in the agricultural sector and the recovery is expected to continue at a modest pace in the second half of the year. And what does the data indicate for Nigeria? Well, according to NKC Research, a South African research firm specializing in African economics, oil output was always going to play a significant role in driving Nigeria's growth dynamics this year, and oil's contribution to GDP growth will become more pronounced in the second half. The poor performance of manufacturing and services sectors is concerning, but improved forex supply should support a gradual rebound in manufacturing activity moving forward. The fact that it now also seems more likely that the central bank will be able to maintain its forex market intervention 
interventions for the duration of the year bodes well for manufacturing and the economy in general. Consumer demand may also start to rebound slightly towards the end of the year in line with lower inflation, which would ultimately translate into stronger services sector output. Increased fiscal spending following the delayed passing of the budget this year presents yet more upside potential. So now the recession might be over on paper, but uh, mm -hmm. does this really reflect what's happening on the ground in South Africa? On paper, this could be considered a star performance with the economy exiting the mild two-quarter recession driven by positive momentum in three major sectors. However, if compared on a seasonally adjusted annualized basis, real economic output in the quarter has really only grown about half a percent compared to the second quarter of 2016. At this economic rate, the unemployment rate, which is now at nearly 28 percent, a multi-year high, it's likely to trend even higher, which could make economic life in South Africa more challenging. So while the recession might technically be over, the environment will unfortunately not change meaningfully for the better until confidence is restored among South African households, corporations and investors. Developments on the political front will also have a lot to do with that. Well, Jill, thank you very much. Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting to us live from New York. Now, all the way to Asia, Chinese President Xi Jinping Tuesday called on emerging markets and developing countries to stay together and work harder for South-South cooperation and sustainable development. Xi made the request of the dialogue of emerging markets and developing countries, uh, which was attended by leaders of BRICS uh, countries, rather, and, and those are Bra Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Now, the dialogue at the ninth BRICS summit is proposed by China to pull together emerging markets and developing countries and push BRICS as a leading platform for South-South cooperation. A record 1,200 attendees, including representatives from nearly 80 Fortune 500 multinationals gathered for the two-day BRICS business forum in Xiamen, as South African President Jacob Zuma called the event a great success. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> the very fact that the BRICS countries represent half of the population of the world, our programs are in fact impacting on those people. <clears throat> that means we BRICS, in fact, can change the world. Yeah. And I think that's an understanding of people who have about uh, BRICS, within BRICS. There is harmony, uh, there is understanding, there is common thinking. The very fact that BRICS has this instrument, it tells you that BRICS has a capacity and a possibility to influence half the population of the world. And therefore, that indicates the importance of BRICS as an organization. Well, this year, China proposed BRICS Plus to invite leaders of five other developing countries, Egypt, Guinea, Mexico, Tajikistan, and Thailand. Well, one of China's biggest textile mills is planning its first North American factory in a small town in the southern U.S. state of Arkansas. VOA's Ping Zhang went to have a look at local expectations and the promise of new jobs. Forest City is a small town near the Mississippi River, where the Chinese textile giant Shandong Rui is planning a $410 million investment to spin yarn at a factory where local workers once built Japanese televisions. Mayor Larry Bryant says the company is already working on training programs at the local community college. I think everybody is happy, everybody is waiting. And uh, if they say, uh, if they were to tell people tomorrow to come out and uh, fill out an application, uh, they would have thousands tomorrow. Rui's project is going to consume 200,000 bales of Arkansas cotton annually. That's nearly all the cotton the state grows each year. So Arkansas Economic Development Commission Executive Director Mike Preston expects a surge of new planting. That's going to make ten you know, turn around and put money back into their pockets and the people that they employ, uh, as well as the, everyone in between, the people who are, you know, bailing the cotton to those who are transporting it and bring it to the facility and everyone transporting it out. So the supply chain on a, on a company like this and a project like this are just, you know, they're exponential. Some Chinese investors in the U.S. are facing challenges from labor unions amid claims of workplace culture clashes. 
Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson has brought nearly $2 billion of Chinese investment to his state. He says there are always cultural differences to work through. And there's things that we can learn from China uh, entrepreneurship and China workers and how they do things. They, hey, that's a great idea that we ought to adopt here and vice versa. I think that you'll see that uh, the China business leaders will see some very good practices that we have that they may want to adopt. So I see this as a great uh, win for both sides whenever we have those exchanges. Delta Q barbecue owner Pierre Evans says the new Chinese bosses will get a warm welcome in Forest City. Uh, it can't do anything but help not only my business but all the businesses. I mean it, that influx of income and influx of money is going to be uh, a big impact to a small community like this. Local leaders are especially encouraged by the company's promise to create 800 jobs and offer wages more than $15 an hour. That's nearly double the minimum wage in the community which has been struggling economically for decades. Ping Zhang, VOA News, Forest City, Arkansas. Well, Monday was Labor Day in the United States, a federal holiday which was originally a celebration of the dignity of work but it, was, it has gradually evolved into a long weekend celebrating the unofficial end of summer. VOA's Nicoleta Illich reports on an exhibit at the National Museum of American History that portrays working Americans over the last 250 years. The exhibit, entitled American Enterprise, starts with the merchant era, which covers the 1770s to the 1850s. There were fur trappers, there were farmers and artisans and merchants, and all of them worked pretty closely together. Trade developed when the fur trappers living in the Midwest would sell their furs 800 kilometers to the south in exchange for the goods they wanted. This then is very different from artisans in the East Coast where they were working initially in their homes and in their small shops behind their homes, they produced goods and they sold them to people they knew, to neighbors. Eventually, those goods were made in factories. Industrialization changed workers' lives. Curator Peter Liebold organized a part of the exhibit dealing with the corporate era from the 1860s to the 1930s really covers the period where workers are moving from rural areas as farmers into cities uh, as industrial workers. So it's this real major transformation in the nature of work. While farmers and artisans had control over their own lives, says Liebold, they lost that control in factories. As the nation industrialized and owners and managers became more powerful, there were always conflicts. Investors wanted a bigger piece of the pie, while the workers fought for greater benefits. The only tradition in the United States is the tradition of no traditions, that uh, um, throughout the history of the country, um, people have uh, um, had very strong opinions, and nobody ever wins. The biggest companies at that time, like Carnegie Steel, Standard Oil, and Ford Motor, employed tens of thousands of workers. Factories got bigger, more specialized machinery. Uh, the work that any individual did became much narrower. So instead of a skilled worker that did all phases of operation, uh, the workers became uh, cogs in a machine. The work was completely depersonalized as factories became the norm. But innovation, says Liebold, is one of the keys to American history. The nation has, has been very quick to continue to change. That as one technique is, is mastered, new techniques come up and, and the old ones are left behind. In the consumer era, between the 1940s and 1970s, consumers were encouraged by advertisers to buy more goods and services. The nature of work um, does start to change um, in the latter part of, of of the 1800s and, and quickly in the in the 1900s, um, with uh, the rise of uh, of retail, with the rise of service 
uh, sector jobs. In the 1980s, women started playing a broader role in the U.S. economy, and the new global era arrived. National borders ceased to be less important, and uh, um, being able to trade around the world becomes very important. The workforce itself becomes um, much more mobile. Today, some Americans are questioning the idea of globalization, and experts are debating whether it will continue or nations will put up trade barriers and retreat into smaller manufacturing and consumption patterns in the future. For Voice of America, Nicoletta Illich. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, an NGO in Europe trains African migrants to work as beekeepers. We'll be right back. deixou o país num estado verdadeiramente caótico do ponto de vista económico. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. Nearly one-third of all food produced for human consumption worldwide is wasted or lost before it can reach consumers. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization says even if just one-fourth of that food could be saved, it would be enough to feed 870 million hungry people. One initiative to combat food waste and reach the hungry is catching on in many cities, community refrigerators. VOA's Faith Lapidus reports. The idea is simple. Instead of throwing away unused, still good to eat food, local businesses and residents can leave it in a public refrigerator for others. This new fridge is situated in the heart of London's Brixton district. Neighboring business owners help stock and clean the fridge each day. According to the People's Fridge founders, food waste is a huge issue in Britain. On average, restaurants throw away 900,000 tons of food each year, while households waste the equivalent of 24 edible meals a month. But with 8.4 million people in Britain living in food insecurity, that food could be going to good use, and the people's fridge helps bridge that gap. Employees at the Ritzy Cinema are now giving their cafe's surplus cakes to the fridge instead of sending them to a landfill. We heard about it, a staff member had come down and heard about the, the project and it just seems like a great idea. Uh, businesses like ours, we waste a lot of food off and to then donate it to people who are in need and to help support the community in Brixton, which we're a big part of, is uh, kind of important to us. A group of 25 food activists came up with the idea of starting the People's Fridge and raised more than $2,500 to start the project. Food we've put on the shelves or we've had put on the shelves is generally leaving the shelves within 36 hours of it being there. There are lots of people who are in work, who are, who are receiving an income but who still can't afford the rising costs of food and who really benefit from such initiatives. Uh, here, from, from my experience, it certainly feels like there is, there is demand and the demand is rising. Anyone can donate food or take it out. 
the People's Fridge provides a visible focus for cutting food waste and feeding the hungry in London. Founders hope they'll inspire other cities around the world. For writer Faisal El Masri, I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, aid groups have criticized efforts by European leaders to stem the flow of migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, arguing Europe's economy actually needs more workers. One NGO in Italy has been trying to fill the gap by training African migrants to work as beekeepers and then pairing them up with local honey producers in need of employees. Uh, Ricky Schreier reports from Alessandria, Italy. The only interaction Abdul Adan had with bees back home in Senegal was when one stung his mouth as a child while he was eating fresh honey. But his fear of bees is a thing of the past. It has been one week since we put in a new queen, and I am looking to see if the queen is here or not. Adan is part of Be My Job, a program in northern Italy that trains migrants and refugees as beekeepers and agricultural workers. Be My Job has trained 107 people total, mostly from West Africa, since launching in 2004. Yes, our beds are, are always full and uh, every time a person leaves the project uh, and so we have a spare uh, place that, uh, that, that place uh, is uh, um, covered straight away just in, within uh, two days' time. The reason for creating the program was simple. Honey producers needed the workers. According to the international aid group Oxfam, Italy will need an estimated 1.6 million more workers during the next decade to sustain its welfare and pension plans. On one hand, there's a huge problem with unemployment. But the other issue is that it's not all that easy to find workers for agriculture. So in reality, Italian agriculture is based on the work of foreigners. Adan has become one of their most accomplished trainees. And now he even trains others. He escaped to Italy by boat in 2015 after being tortured and held as a slave laborer in Libya. I already passed through stages that are harder than working with bees. If I tell you the Libyans who took us for work, do you know how much we had to eat? One piece of bread a day. And we worked hard. That is not to say life in Italy is easy. I feel very lonely, very, very lonely sometimes when I think of my family. It makes me want to go back home. But that's the story of immigration. I am looking for money. Maybe one day I go back to my country, or one day I can bring my family. No one knows what the future holds. For now, it is August and almost the end of honey harvesting season. There is work to be done. Ricky Shryock for VOA News in Alessandria, Italy. Well, that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our VOA website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC and in the mornings to Daybreak Africa. That's between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here, have a good night. To English in a minute. A cannon used to be a common military weapon. Loose cannon. So are Anna and Jonathan talking about an old battle? Hey, I'm looking for someone to host a political event tomorrow night. Can your friend Sylvia help out? Sylvia? She's a loose cannon. You never know what she's going to say. She could easily